Um, I want to talk about second and third order nonlinear gradient theory. Nonlinear finite deformations, large deformations. Because um, I'm very much interested in the structure of such theories, not in particular applications. Uh, but in the in the structure, yeah, in the structure of the theory, in the microstructure of such a theory, and you get rid of these of much of the information if you linearize it. So if you really want to understand, you should go into the finite, into the nonlinear regime, and the second order theory already exists since uh, a couple of years maybe decades. Uh, so we tried the third order theory, just putting one on top. In order to see is there a direct seizes, is damage mechanics, biomechanics, fatigue, etc, etc, etc. So I don't mention uh, all of them, but only half of them. Um, and most of the publications are, of course, on small deformations or linear theory. So the finite theory is still an exception. Um, I want to refer to two papers of mine uh, concerning the second order theory. One is uh, the elasticity and plasticity and one is a thermodynamical framework. Uh, this is a paper by Christian Reyer on third order grain elasticity. We are currently preparing that for the Journal of Elasticity has already been accepted. And you find all the all results in the compendium on gradient materials and Google already knows this title. So if you put it into the Google search machine you will find it immediately. But be careful to have the last edition there which is from October last year. Uh, so in the finite regime you immediately have a lots of questions. Uh, of course, one of the first is what about balance laws? What about boundary conditions? If you go into material theory, you want to know what reduced forms are, how the transformation behavior of the variables is, what are appropriate variables for modeling constitutive behavior in this regime. Um, then, of course, thermodynamics. What does the second law impose on restrictions onto these models? And many more questions. Symmetry considerations. What is a symmetry transformation for such materials? What does it mean that such a material is, for example, isotropic or anisotropic? All these questions immediately arise. Um, one thing very important is the notation. You need a shorthand writing for that, otherwise you will um, ground it in, in, in indices. Um, and I will use a simple dot as a simple contraction of double for the double, etc. And um, I will make use of the so-called Rayleigh product. The Rayleigh product is between a second order tensor and a kth order tensor. And the second order tensor applies to all the base vectors, leaving the coefficients untouched. Somebody called that Rayleigh product. I don't know whether it's really introduced by Rayleigh, but many people nowadays use it. The problem is, in the theory, in the gradient theory, we have to deal with third and fourth order tensors which have the characteristic that the first entry is different from the other ones. The last three or two ones are gradients, are gradient vectors. The first one is a tangent vector. So if you want to make a pullback of such a tensor, you have to treat the first entry different from the other ones. And this is why we introduced a second kind of product indicated by such a a ring or what is it? A bagel. A bagel what you can eat. So we call it bagel product. 
um, which acts in the first entry differently from the rest one. The rest is simply the second order tensor, but in the first one is t to the minus transpose. Has to do with the different character of these. And this product turned out to be very useful in the contact of, of higher gradient materials. So keep that in mind that the little bagel means this product. And we mainly use it for pulling back something from a spatial description into a material description in the reference placement. Okay, um, I want to give a few comments on the balance laws and on the boundary conditions for two and third gradient materials. Uh, since this is a very interesting topic and the, uh, in particular the boundary conditions are by no means trivial for higher order theories as we, you will see soon. And in the second part, which is the longer part, um, but I hope to, to end up before supper, uh, the second part uh, then is on constitutive modeling, in particular elasticity, and if there's some time less left before midnight, um, also on, on plasticity. Okay, so let's start with the balance laws. Um, a good starting point is always the principle of virtual power. Um, we introduce the internal power of the body as a global concept, um, which is a scalar, of course, and this scalar depends on the motion in the past of the whole body. And I describe this motion by chi, that means the motion throughout the centuries for the whole body as a global thing, as a function function of time and of the material point. And secondly, um, of the virtual velocity field, which is nothing like it but a test function. And we assume that in the second argument it is continuous with respect to a certain metric, of course, and it is linear, point-wise linear. These are the two assumptions. And then you can extract, once you have such a functional, you can extract all the balance laws by an invariance requirement. That means that this scalar is invariant under change of observer. All, ob all observers at the end of the year find at your gas meter at home the same value so that the account is also the same. Should be invariant under change of observer. So um, we have then the lo localized form, which is due to Ries representation theorem on Sobolev spaces, something like that. Depends on the norm. If you take the one norm, you have just this part. This is for the second, third, and fourth one. And um, the first one is simply a vector times the virtual velocity field. Both of them are fields, so we have the integration over the body. The second part is a second order tensor times the gradient of the velocity, etc. And it depends on the metric how far you have to go. So in our case, we go up to the third or the fourth term. Throughout this lecture, I will color the second order terms in red and the fourth order terms in blue. Now, um, if you have such gradients in the integral, um, it, it's, it provokes for, for partial integration. Uh, so by partial integration, you can always bring one nabla from here to that side and transform something on the surface. So this is the partial integration volume to surface. Some people call that, well the people in Germany would call that Gauss theorem, the people in Russia and Ukraine would call Ostrogratsky theorem, in France Poincaré, 
in England Green Stokes, in Italy Piola, I guess, in the United States uh, Marilyn Monroe or something like that. Okay. So everybody has this author. Then, if you still have uh, a gradient operator or a Ratzinger said that relativism is dangerous. That's right, yeah. To make rel relativism in this context is dangerous. We just, we just call this formula partial integration, okay? Internationally. Okay. Integration by parts. Integration by parts, yeah. So, first you have from the divergence of a vector field on the volume into something on the surface of this volume. But then you can also transform by integration by parts a part of the divergence on the surface into some other part and something on the edges of the surface, which are the limits of the surface. And we call that with an L, which stands for line. So it's a line integral. But this is not all. If you still have a divergence operator left under the integral, you can do it again by integrating by parts the part of this divergence operator into something again on the line and well this is no more an integral it's a point it's the vertex points of the body where the where the edge lines end so you cannot integrate there is simply the value at these points so in instead of the of the integration of these of this Leibniz symbol you just have a the sum of all vertex points there so if you apply all these partial integrations to these parts here not the first but these parts here repeatedly as far as possible, you end up in a form, well this is a short hand for that, you end up in a form, you have something in the volume which is the first vector, the divergence of the second, the second divergence of the third one, and the third divergence of this one. But then you have on the surface something which has a vector value, something which has a second order tensor value, acting on the projection, on the normal projection of the gradient of the virtual velocity. So n is always the normal on the surface. And you have another vector which acts on the projection of the second gradient onto the normal. And then by another partial integration you get the line parts. You have a vector field on the line acting on the velocity and you have a second order tensor field acting on the transversal part of the gradient. And last but not least you have point forces in all the vertex points. But I have to explain what the T3 is, what this is, what this is, what this is. The 3 stands for third order theory, which of course is only there. So let's take this, only this guy as an example. Here we go. So you remember we have this, I have it here. We are as a representative volume element, we are just looking at this part and not on the other part, just at this one. And there is a vector field called T3. And this vector field is defined in such a complicated manner. So you have the higher tensor order fields, the divergences of them, times a structural tensor. And there's one structural tensor of order 2, one of order 3, one of order 4, and the zero one. 
And the second order, this guy here, is defined as the transversal divergence or tangential divergence of the normal. So if it's flat, if the surface is flat, this is zero times n times n, so there's a projection in it, minus the tangential gradient of n, which would be also zero if it's flat. Then there's a third order, structural tensor or geometrical tensor, this is purely geometry then, which is this one, you have higher gradients there, and a fourth order one, which is this one. This is only one term. So it becomes quite complicated. And it's a very, very lengthy, lengthy calculation to end up in this form. But the advantage of this form is that you have a separation of the virtual fields and its gradients and the dynamical parts and their projections. That means the purely dynamical ones and the geometrical ones as a final form. Um, by this form of the, of the um, principle of virtual velocity, you can immediately extract the boundary conditions, the Neumann and the Dirichlet boundary conditions. Uh, what is interesting, if you really have a third gradient material, you have these point forces and you have the line forces, you have concentrated line forces on the edges of the surface parts. Now, I don't want to go into the details of that, but instead switch over to the material theory. If you want to make material theory in the range of large deformation, you have to fulfill the Euclidean objectivity principle. And the best way to do that is to introduce material quantities. Um, that means reduced forms. Um, so if we start with a classical, with a simple material, you have Cauchy's stress tensor and the gradient of the velocity there. Then the usual trick is to pull back the Cauchy stress tensor into the reference placement, which gives rise to the piola kirchhoff type stress tensor. And instead of gradient of the velocity, you use the right Cauchy green tensor, the, the material derivative of that guy. Now we try to do the same for second and third order theory. And for second order theory, you simply add a part uh, with a third order ten stress sensor acting on the second gradient of the velocity. And you can also find a material form of that. The material form of that consists of a piola kirchhoff type stress sensor. Here you have this bagel product instead of the Rayleigh product, but the rest is very similar to the real piola kirchhoff tensor. And you have a material configuration tensor, or its time derivative here, which is f to the minus 1 gradient of f. Some people call that connection tensors, others call it curvature tensor. I would prefer the expression configuration tensor, but it's up to you. This is often used. Of course, you can also use other material variables, for example, the gradient of the right Cauchy green tensor if you want to. Um, it's all equivalent, so you can one to one um, transform one theory using one variable into the other one. So it's basically up to practical reasons why we choose this guy and not another one. And we are not the only ones to do so. Now, we include the third gradient of the velocity with a fourth order stress tensor. Now, what happens is rather surprising because you can show that you can introduce a fourth order configuration tensor very similar to this one only here's a second gradient of f times f to the minus 1, so that a fourth order piola kirchhoff like stress tensor acts on the material derivative of this guy, but, and this is a surprising fact, you have an additional part so that this fourth order tensor also 
works on the third order one. So there's a dispersive effect in that. And of course you can reorganize the whole thing such that you have one tensor acting on K3 dot and another stress tensor acting on K4 dot, but this third order tensor is a mixture of the original one and the fourth order one. Now the question arises, was it a bad luck because of the a choice of the variables which is pr probably not so good. Is there another material variable which avoids this dispersive effect? That would be very interesting be because it's a bit confusing to always work with different stress tensors. And the answer is no, it does not exist. One can prove mathematically that such a tensor does not exist. So we have to live with it. But it only occurs in a third order theory. In the second order theory, you don't see that effect. Okay, we keep that in mind. Um, I wrote for this terms in bracket, which is this one. I, I entered with the original definition and I put this into index notation. If you prefer index notation, you can work with that if you want. Now, change of reference placement. If you work with material variables, you need, um, you, you need the reference placement, and if you have another reference placement, all these variables will change. Although you consider the same body in the same situation. So we have to um, show how a change of the reference placement acts on all these variables. And this becomes very important later for isomorphy and symmetry concepts. So we all know change of the gradient of the reference placement is a second order invertible tensor. Uh, if you do this for the deformation gradient, you have simply this form. If you do it for the right Cauchy Green tensor, you simply have this form. This is all well known. For higher order tensors, the things can become quite complicated. In particular, for this dispersive term here, for the fourth order one. You have a fourth order tensor which is transformed. You add one, which is here, and you also have a combination of the third order ones. So this makes it quite, comf quite uncomfortable. But on the other hand, there is no choice to avoid this problem. Oh, for the stress tensors, it's, it's more easy. It, it has simply this form. Let's go into elasticity. In elasticity, we assume that a, an energy exists and the energy depends on the motion of the body, on its gradient, second gradient, and third gradient, if you want. And then you impose the invariance requirement, which people sometimes call material objectivity, but there are other names for that. And then you can find a reduced form, and one choice of a reduced form is right Cauchy Green tensor, and these two Ks in the second and third argument. This is a reduced form, which automatically fulfills this invariance requirement. And you get these stress tensors by derivation by these potential forms. Derivation of, of this energy with respect to C, with respect to K3, and with respect to K4. But again, you have this complicated dispersive effect in that. <clears throat> elastic isomorphy, what does it mean? Um, if the elastic law depends on the choice of the reference placement, um, then if you want to express the fact that two points have the same material behavior, you cannot simply say that the um, form of the energy is the same. Um, only after an appropriate change of the reference placement it could be the same. Um, and uh, this is given by this definition, two elastic materials point are called isomorphic. If one can find reference placement with respect to which the elastic energy function becomes equal. This is a nice 
and transparent definition, but it's far from being practical. Uh, practically, one introduces simply these isomorphic tensors, a second order, third and a fourth order tensor, and then uh, shows that such a relation holds for all variables in here. So you have to transform the C here, you have to transform the third order configuration, which is this here, and the fourth order one, which is quite complicated. <coughs> and you have a constant which is rather meaningless. Okay. Elastic symmetry is auto-isomorphy. Something is isomorphic to itself in a non-trivial way. It's always isomorphic to itself in a trivial way, but it's interesting to find a non-trivial way. So, if you can find three tensors, second, third, and fourth order, such that this relation holds for all values of these um, configuration variables, then we would call it a symmetry transformation. So in the classical theory, you have just a second order tensor, which is normally assumed to be unimodular. Here you have three such tensors, and also the symmetry relation becomes rather complicated. I wrote it down then for the stress laws, but this is not important right now. Now, of course, all these symmetry transformation transform are uh, in an algebraic sense, a group. So they fulfill the group operations. One of the group operations is the, comp the composition. If you have two of these symmetry transformations, then the composition looks like that. Rather complicated. But that's how it is. In the, for simple materials, you have just the combination of the two second order tensors. But for higher order materials, you have these combinations here. The identity is a second order identity in the first entrance and the zero in the second and third order entry. Interesting. And the inverse of some of these members of the symmetry group is simply the inverse of the first one, but simply more complicated in the second one and even more complicated in the third one. But that's how it is. It forms a group. Little is known about the role of these second and third order tensors in the symmetry group. The first one is relatively simple or the interpretation of the first one is relatively simple, coming from simple materials. But for the others, it becomes rather complicated. And we still know very little about them. You're looking at the... Okay. Um, to do something very practical, we linearize this theory. But as a finite the theory, like a Salvinan Kirchhoff theory, large deformation but linear. Um, so we assume that green strain tensor is, its norm is small compared to one, and the norm of these two tensors is also small compared to one, but you need a factor here of the dimension of length. Um, because these guys are not dimensionless. Well, this is our goal to put something into the theory which has a dimension of length to describe internal length scales. So these are under these assumptions we can linearize the stress laws, uh, which means that we have a square form for the energy. The square form looks like that. You have a fourth order elasticity tensor like for simple materials. But you have additionally a third order one, a square form on K3, and no, a sixth order one, and an eight order one as a square form of K4. And you have these mixed tensors, a fifth order one on these two guys, a sixth order on these two guys, 
and the seventh order on these two. So you have lots, lots of elasticities, tensors, but this is a general theory, so uh, they are a general linear theory. And for simple materials, you have the well-known 21 constants. For second order theory, you have already 300 ones. And for fourth order theory, you have 1,480 and something independent constants. So this is a lot for modeling. Very interesting for people who do experiments for the identification. Need a lot of experiments. But of course you can reduce this number if you assume isotropy. Isotropy means any rotation in the first entry. And moreover, if you assume centrosymmetry. That means with any element in the first entry, also it's negative is a symmetry transformation. If you do so, then you have a, the, the centrosymmetric isotropic form which you already find in, in Mindlin's paper. And this contains for a simple material only two constants, the Lamy constants, which we all know, for gradient material only seven, and for a third order, all in all only 17 from 1,400 something drastically reduced. So, okay. Shall I go into plasticity? We start with plasticity by defining what an elastic range is. So we consider a plasticity theory based on elastic ranges. And an el elastic range is a subset of all the configuration here associated with an elastic law or an elastic energy such that for any process which starts in this elastic range and is all the time maintained in this elastic range at the end you can determine the stresses by this energy. This is the usual way also for simple material, how you can introduce plasticity. Um, we need a second assumption, and the second assumption we make is that all the elastic laws for the infinitely many elastic ranges are isomorphic, which simply means that the elastic behavior does not vary. I mean, this is what we do if you look into a handbook for the Young's modulus of aluminum or of steel or of copper, it doesn't say after so much plastic deformation it has this value and after so much plastic deformation it has this value. You, do, you just get one value and everybody assumes that the Young's modulus is not affected by plastic deformation. So a mathematical form of this assumption is that all the elastic laws for the different elastic ranges is isomorphic. This means now that if you have the elastic law of one elastic range, you can trans transform it by any, to, to any other elastic range by introducing these three variables which we already know from the isomorphic condition. So in a natural way, you find three plastic variables, uh, second order, third order, and fourth order. Of course, the isomorphic condition does not hold un under each and all circumstances. For some materials, the texture has an influence on the elastic variables. But in many cases, you can simply neglect it. Um, this is what almost everybody does. Who does who, who takes into account the, the, the change of the elastic variables under plastic deformations? Okay, this is the results, the consequences for the, for the stress law. So I don't want to go into that. Uh, a yield criterion. What is a yield criterion now? We 
uh, formulate the yield criterion in the configuration space and not in the stress space, but we, you can later transform it from the configuration space into the stress space by the elastic law if you want to. But to start, we keep the configuration as the independent variables and the stresses as the dependent variables. So the yield condition depends on all internal variables, which are these three plastic variables, on the configuration and on additional variables, which are hardening variables, variables of any order, or a set of such variables. I just call them ZP. And if this is zero, then the material is on the yield limit, and if it tends to be to, to increment elastically, then you have the loading condition. This can be directly translated from the theory of simple plasticity into higher gradient plasticity. So there is nothing special in that. We need flow rules. Flow rules means if both the yield criterion and the loading condition are fulfilled, then the plastic variables must vary. And they vary with respect to flow rules and hardening rules. So we put a first order um, differential equation depending on all the internal variables which we have so far, plus the rate of these three configuration variables. And we need that for three plastic variables and for the hardening variables as well. We will assume that these are rate independent, so we can make an ansatz for them. And the ansatz is with the, with the plastic consistency parameter, which is assumed to be the same for the four equations, four evolution equations such that here not the complete rates occur, but only normed rates. These are normed. These are, these three rates are not the exact rates, but normed by a factor, by a common factor, which is this. And if you do so, you assure rate independence. To give just small examples, uh, George, um, Ivan George is somewhere in the room. <laughs> he he worked, worked these out together with Christian Raya. Uh, and I don't go into the details, but the illustrative example is you have a block which is glued here, which is fixed here on the bottom surface, and you prescribe the displacement of one of these edges which is possible in such a theory. And then they showed that if the theory is of sufficient high um, degree, order, uh, then you have no spurious mesh dependence in that. Okay, and the other example is you have a tetraedon, a pyramid, and you prescribe the displacement of this top point, just of this point. And then if you have a third order theory, you can show that this regularizes the singularity out. So you have no spurious mesh dependence even at the top there. Okay, this all can be continued. Uh, we have a thermodynamic play, um, frame for that as well. We found out what the uh, consequences of the second law in form of then extended clausus dum inequality is you have these potentials um, known from simple materials and you have additional residual um, unbalance conditions there. Nothing unexpected in that, but I don't want to go into that. So I end up again with the advertisement for the for the Havana meeting next week. Hope many of you can be met there. Okay, thank you. I think if you want to see the equation, you have to be come closer. I am close. Okay, so you have seen the equation. So you have a question then? Yes, I Victor. have a question. Okay, you told that... Louder, perhaps, louder. Please. 
I will try. <laughs> you mentioned that independently you say, say that you can use K tensors or gradient of C. Or others, yes, yeah. Or others, it's okay. But what about definition of material symmetry group? Are the same definitions, the same group operation if you choose, choose different? No, they are different, of course. If you change the variables, you have other transformations. But physically, it should express the same thing, of course. Yeah. Then the next question, the yeah. number of parameters, these stiffness parameters, should yeah. be the same? That is exactly the same, right, yeah. It doesn't, it does not depend on the choice of the variables, right, yeah. And last. But the behavior of such a linear law, that changes. This is up to the choice, yeah. Yes. Yeah. You're right. And about unimodular tensors. Yeah. In your material symmetry group, the first tensor also must be unimodular. And this. No, must not. It can be, no. Many people assume that it is unimodular, but, but I don't see a physical reason for that. No. It's an additional assumption which is very practical, which many people do, but I don't think that there, this is necessary. Okay. Interesting question, yeah. But it doesn't need to be positive definite anymore, of course. Yes, of it can course. be negative. Yeah. Yeah. You said you can prove that, uh, um, because you, uh, we know that the strain measure that you have used for the second gradient is uh, for finite deformation is convenient one because uh, yeah. it does not lead what you call this dispersive effect. Huh? Yeah. And you said you can prove that there is no such uh, convenient strain measure for the third. third order. How can you prove that? How do you prove You it? assume you have it, yes. and then you write down the integrability conditions, and you show that there, there's no existence to fulfill them. And if you apply this technique to the second order, yeah. starting, uh, you find the proper... You find it, yeah. Okay. yeah. Interesting. The question which I cannot answer, and that's why I'm fearing that, is um, could you make a bad choice for the second order one such that you have this dispersive effect already there. Honestly, I didn't prove that. I didn't show that any choice uh, if you take is the okay. C will give you a dispersive effect. At the Would it? I think, huh? If you don't I take think so too, yeah. <coughs> oh, you can try, yeah? Yeah, we could try that. Yeah. Other questions? Yes? You show uh, the um, numerical so solutions for the cube and for the pyramid, yes? Yeah. Uh, why uh, should we use the third order uh, con continuum? Um, and why do can't we use the second order for these problems? Um, the, the, the answer is very simple. If you have a second order, if you have a simple material, then you cannot describe neither concentrated line forces nor point forces. If you have a second order theory, you can describe concentrated line forces but not point forces. Only for third order theory you have these point forces. On the other hand, man might, man might raise a question uh, does it then make sense to have a fourth or fifth order theory? What, what, what is beyond point forces? Of course, there's nothing beyond point forces. There's no difference between second and third order continuum for the line forces, yes? No difference. For the line forces, you already have the normalization for a second, yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, there's a difference in the solution. Depends on the on the extra terms, but uh, for the regularization, you don't need the third order one. Yeah. Regarding your symmetry uh, conditions. Yeah. So when you have applied it to to get the isotropic case, you put this a three a four to zero, or or you consider only the uh, the uh, a. Only the first, yeah, only the first. What does it, 
if you consider this A3, what does it bring for restriction in the symmetry? What does it mean, in fact, we know that? or Because finally you have considered the standard uh, symmetry group. Yeah, little is known about that, yeah. Is it necessary or it does not? It is necessary to have that, yeah. yeah. But what, which role it plays needs know. further research, yeah. Okay. It's still a lot, lot of open. Yeah, but once you... Symmetry here. <laughs> it's always the same story. You open one window and you see many more yeah. closed windows I behind. <laughs> So this is related to a change of configuration also for plasticity after huh? you change as well. Okay, thank you very much. It was a good start. Before we need these results all over the week.